Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's uh, GBTA Europe Town Hall. As you can see from the screen, this uh, Europe Town Hall has been made possible by Trip Actions, um, and so we thank them very much for their for their support of of GBTA and and this session in particular. Um, looking at what we've got coming up um, on the town hall today, we're going to have an update from Jens Lieltorp, who is our U European Regional Representative on the GBTA Global Board of Directors. Um, I'm going to be telling you a little bit about what's happening in Europe. Um, and then we've got some uh, a couple of great pieces of content. Um, one is about navigating Brexit uh, with Katie Marples from DXE Technology. And then we're talking about getting started with sustainability with Helen Hodgkinson. Um, from Cactus. Um, so I hope you um, I hope you find that um, content of interest. If throughout the session, if you have anything that you would like to, any questions you'd like to ask, either Jens, myself, Katie, or Helen, please just use the um, QA box um, in the bottom of the of the of your screen. So um, we've got a lot to get through. So with without further ado, I'm just going to hand over to Jens Lieltorp. Um, who will give us an update on GBTA from a global perspective. Jens, the floor is yours. All right. Um, thanks, Catherine, and, um, and hello to you all. And uh, as you may be aware, this summer I was elected to the European Regional Seat on the Global Board of Directors, and I thank you all for that. Uh, the seat was created as part of the many bylaw changes that were passed earlier this year, you may remember. My role is to represent this region, Europe, and its members on the global board and to help make the board of directors more global. In order to do that properly and to get an understanding of what works well, uh, what works well in Europe and what does not, one of the first things I've done was to meet with the leadership of, uh, of, uh, of our European partners, GBJ France, GBJ Italy, and our European committees. These meetings were so valuable in uncovering the priorities and concerns that we have actually agreed to continue having these touch bases at least quarterly going forward. During uh, these partner meetings, I was struck by how committed they all are to our industry and volunteer community. To be honest, I had sort of expected a more reserved attitude, uh, mostly because of the stormy weather GPTA experienced last year, but instead I found everybody to be very supportive, encouraged and committed by the changes we have seen at the GBTA. But there are of course things we could and should do better, and some of those things were mentioned consistently across Europe. And I'd like to go through just five of those. Firstly, there's a desire for GBTA to become properly global. I think that's something we all share. We have definitely been making steps in that direction with the creation of the international board seats, but this is just the beginning. Personally, I would like to see a designated European supplier seat at the board, similar to the direct board seat, which I hold now. And uh, further to that, we would also like to see GBTA expand more into geo geo global geography, such as Asia, Pac, South and Latin America. Secondly, uh, there was voice, voiced a desire to be able to experience GBTA in a more localized European way in terms of communications, education and, uh, and the GBTA hub. There's a perception that GBTA has been too US centric in communication and content. And uh, I'm happy to say that some com communication initiatives have already been taken. And I know that there are more exciting developments on the way to support this goal. Among others, an exciting relaunch of the hub as a source of information and sharing. Thirdly, People want to know more about our advocacy efforts in Europe. And I'm pleased to tell you that uh, Catherine and Shane are working on a monthly advocacy newsletter to ensure that members are fully informed about our interactions with authorities and the consequent results. Fourthly, the European members want to know what the strategy is for, uh, for GPT globally and how Europe fits into that. And I can assure you that uh, this is in the works. The strategy process could not be started sooner as it had to await the arrival of our new CEO. 
uh, the recent bylaw changes and the elections of the new board. Going forward, I will be pushing from my position as a board member to make this uh, more of a consultative process in the future. And by that, I mean with a higher degree of involvement from members themselves. And finally, fifthly, uh, there was a call for more resources in Europe. There's a general feeling in Europe that DBTA resources are stretched in Europe and that more could be achieved uh, given more resources. I would like to thank all those who took time to meet with me. Your input is invaluable in helping me be the voice of Europe on the board. And I would ask you all to keep that feedback coming so I can better represent you. And I would actually like to extend that invitation to any DBTA Europe member. Your input is key in order for me to best represent your thoughts and, and wishes for DBTA in Europe. So bring it on. So far on the board, I have been inducted and attended two board meetings where we have started planning for 2022. The first meeting was back in August and it was mostly an introduction to being on the DBTA board. Second meeting in September was more of a proper board meeting, if you like, discussing ongoing projects, initiatives, responsibilities, budget and strategy. Uh, I think um, I would like you to know that I have a very good feeling of the board. Every, everyone, besides being very competent, everyone seems, to, seems eager to do a fresh start for DBJ to become more global, transparent, relevant and not least to create value for all members, direct and indirect buyers and suppliers. They're all very keen on changing DBTA for the better and agree that the time is now. So we have great opportunities ahead of us. Being on the board, you also get to involve yourself in board subcommittees. Um, and as a result, uh, I can share with you that I am now chairing the membership committee and I sit on the communications committee in, in the board. And these, are, I'm, quite, I'm quite happy with that because these are the two areas where, where I feel most value can be created for members. And it gives me the opportunity to, into, the opportunity to influence where it is most important to the stakeholders that I, I met with. Uh, and I will keep you posted on this going forward. And I may also reach out in one way or the other uh, for your input. As you may be aware, we are in the process of recruiting a new chair for the European Advisory Board. And I'm pleased to tell you that we have three great candidates who put themselves forward. In the interests of transparency, we have created a quorum that will help to select the chair. And this group includes rep representatives from the Advisory Board, committees, DBTA France and DBTA Italy. We are hoping to be able to announce we're not just hoping, we will announce the new chair in early November, and I will then pass on the baton of chairing the European Advisory Board at our conference in Berlin. Speaking of conference, I'll now hand back to Catherine, who has some news to share in that regard, and thanks for listening. Okay, um, no, thank you, Jens, and uh, I have to echo your, your thanks to the European partners and the leadership of uh, GBTA France Italy and uh, the committees. Those were really, really good meetings. And Jens, thank you for everything you're doing at the minute. It's, um, it's you know, we certainly, I feel so many changes in GBTA at the minute and it's they're really, really, really encouraging. And cool. um, I'm excited to see what 2022 brings for us, but we still got a bit of work to do between now and the end of the year. And so uh, in terms of Europe, as you say, um, uh, Jens, we've got our conference coming up. It's planned for the 6th to the 8th of December in Berlin. And this is going to be a very different conference to what we've had before. All of the content is uh, condensed into two days on the 7th and the 8th of December. And we are, we're starting off with a welcome reception um, on the 6th of December. Um, I have been so excited or so overwhelmed by the response that we had whenever we've opened up our registration and our um, our exhibition sales. We only did that really at the start of, of September. And it's looking like um, our expo is gonna be sold out by uh, by the end of this month, which is really exciting. And, um, and also I've been overwhelmed by the amount of, of registrations. You know, we're not expecting this to be the, you know, the typical, 
um, 1100 person event, um, but it's certainly, you know, the response so far um, to the to the event has been great. It's, I think it's very clear. Lots of people really do want to meet in person. So I really would urge you to, um, if you're if you're thinking of coming, I'd urge you to get on and register before the 4th of, of November. And, um, you know, I think another another aspect of it that's very different than, from what we've had in previous years is we're trying to make this as interactive an event as possible. We know so many of you have not had the opportunity to meet and to interact in the past or in the past 18 months. And so there'll be lots of opportunity for that in terms of social and educational um, formats. So, as I say, please do uh, mark your calendars. And if you can come, come and join us in Berlin, I would be absolutely delighted to welcome you. Um, you know, as, as I said, there's a lot of education content, but we are we are also offering other education programs between now and the end of the year. And one of them is a new one, which I'm very excited about. It's our Travel Risk Management Bootcamp, and it's all to do around the, the new ISO 31030 Travel Risk Management Guideline that has been launched. We've got three deliveries happening. One is in October, um, 19th to 20th of October, and that's actually already sold out. And then we have two further ones, one on the 2nd to the 3rd of November and the 1st to the 2nd of December. So if you um, if you can at all um, register uh, or if you are interested in that, please do um, register for it. Those are virtual deliveries. Um, there's some pre-work to do, um, which will get you set up, set up and started ready for the course. Then there's um, a three hour um, virtual delivery on the 19th of October and a three hour virtual delivery on the 20th of October. So, and hopefully by, by, the, time, by the time you've done that, you will understand what the ISO 31,030 guideline is about and, and be ready to, to implement it into your program. So very exciting stuff. But um, so on to today and the main content, our content of, our, of our town hall. Um, as I say, Trip Actions very kindly is, is sponsoring the town hall and in conversation with Simone um, uh, Buckley, who's our the VP for EMEA for Trip Actions. We wanted to try and identify content that you as um, business travel professionals will need as we're returning to travel. And we, we identified two fairly fairly um, thorny -ish areas. One is Brexit and what it happens, and the second is around sustainability. So um, I am now going to hand over to Simone as she's going to she's going to moderate this this next segment of the of the content. So Simone, over to you. Thanks, Catherine. Hi, everyone. It's really nice to be to be here and be back with GBTA. And just picking up on what Catherine said about GBTA Europe, we're really excited. Um, we're just starting to do our um, sort of first face to face exhibitions and conferences here in the UK and it does make such a huge huge difference I'm looking forward to seeing everybody there um so yeah when we when, when we were chatting to Catherine about what would be useful um I've been in this role for six months and there were two areas that I really needed to kind of um get to grips with one was Brexit and the other one was sustainability and how it relates to us in travel and Katie and I've been working together well we've known each other for quite some time and we've been working together on a number of different things and I knew she was working on a project around Brexit for one of her customers and so um, she shared with me through the progress of how she's addressed the Brexit issues. Um, if you're a UK travel manager or traveller, um, it's perhaps slightly more complicated than it is if you're in the U EU coming into the UK. But she very kindly agreed today to spend the next 10 to 15 minutes just sharing what she went through um, in the hope that it'll be useful to, to you, whether you're a buyer or a supplier in the audience. So, Katie, I'm going to hand over to you if that's OK. Hopefully she's there. Sorry. There we go. Okay, sorry. Um, that's just a little trying to get on the video there. Um, yeah, so so um I'll just give you a quick introduction. Um, I, I work for um DXC technology. I actually work in a part of DXC technology that works um in, in the deliver function. So we work with our clients to to do their and direct procurement as categories and the strategies and, and the management of those categories. My travel is one of my sort of specialist areas. Um, so I was asked, and this now goes back to around about 2018, I was first asked by the mobility and tax managers uh, with the clients I'm working with at the moment, um, what I thought um, the impact of Brexit would be 
on the travel programme. Um, and at the time, I think we thought, yes, there will be an impact on the travel programme, but we really didn't know what that looked like um, because obviously nobody knew what Brexit was going to look like at that time either. Um, so what I found is that there was a lot of talking in the period between the end of 2018 right up until the middle of last year. Um, and obviously the pandemic had hit by then, but we were still talking about what is this impact of Brexit going to be and how are we going to manage it? Um, and we still didn't know what Brexit looked like. Um, but what we did do is, is we, we kind of started looking into the options of what was out there and there'd been talk and a little bit of evidence of systems and tools that other organisations were using um, that could manage certainly the tax side of things better. Um, and, and we wanted to look at how we could actually use that. Um, now, I think now that Brexit is live, I think as we begin to travel again, certainly those of us in the UK and possibly some in Europe and the rest of the world as well, um, are, are going to be seeing that it's, it's becoming much, much more apparent that, that there is an impact from a Brexit on business travel. And that's being felt. And I, and I think um, that's being felt in, in ways of maybe people having to push back the odd project or you've got people traveling and they don't really know what the impact is, what documentation they're needing. I mean, when back in 2018, I don't think I'd really heard much about A1 certificates and um, I knew about business visas and work permits, obviously, but, but certainly didn't know that they were needed in quite the way they're becoming needed now for travel into Europe. Um, so we tended to have specialists who did the visas, but they weren't really looking at the rest of it. We just got the mobility manager to look at that. Um, and when we talk about the impact that we're feeling now um, and what we were talking about in that sort of two year period previous to now, um, our mobility manager was very much identifying that she didn't feel that she could handle all of this on her own. And particularly at the level of travel that this client was doing in 2019. Um, so obviously that changed because of the pandemic and the, the volume of travel came down. So it hasn't really mattered that we haven't had something in place through 2020 and into 2021 when Brexit became live. But now that we are starting to return to travel, we are starting to feel it. So before we embarked on our project, what we tried to do is to look at what was in the market. Um, and there are various different levels of supplier in the market, some very, very established um, sort of big suppliers, um, the likes of the big four who've got established tools because they're doing things in the tax and the immigration areas already. Um, and they are selling those to their clients and obviously to the, 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 the wider sort of population as well. And then there are smaller sort of more specialist relocation type businesses, immigration businesses, and they've built similar sorts of tools or they're using technology that's been specially built for tracking all of this. Um, and it's worthwhile having a look at quite a few of them. We took the route of having demonstrations before we even thought about going to market. Um, so we, over the course of mainly 2019 and 2020, was a good opportunity actually to see a lot of these things. Um, we got calls organised and we spent some time talking to the um, suppliers who were providing these tools and considering whether or not we thought they were a fit with what my client's business wanted. Um, and I think that's another really important area to look at is that there's lots of ways that you could bring these tools into your organization. Um, you can either bring it in as a service, which is what we're looking at. Um, so that is the supplier looking after the tool and um, providing all of the services. You can also look at it as having a tool that your maybe your IT or somebody within the organization manages as well, which gives you more control over it, but means that you probably need to know a bit more about what I'm going to call the downstream services. So that is the piece around, you know, what do you need um, in terms of immigration documentation, social security documentation, and any other actions that are going to need to be arising. Um, now, I know that my client has actually got downstream services in place 
um, for pretty much all of that. So they've got contracts for that. And I think the vast majority of certainly medium to large organisations will have that in place. Um, what I have found through speaking with these um, suppliers is that quite a few of them can also provide the downstream services. So you, you shouldn't feel that you can't get that um, it, by, by just going and looking for a tool. You, you, can, you can look at as a bigger project and to provide full service if, if you want to. Um, once we'd identified kind of what we wanted, we've narrowed our field down then to, I think it was around about 10 suppliers. Um, and we started thinking about what we wanted to ask them in an RFP. Um, the advice that I got was very much to ask detailed RFP questions. So we developed a sort of, I think it was about 140 question RFP um, and, and went out with that. Um, now the tail end of that is still in progress, so I can't give too much information on that. Um, but there were really good opportunities to tailor that around our own business. Um, and, and, and that came from all the work that we'd done speaking with the, the suppliers previously and, and looking at the various tools and, and seeing what we thought would fit. Um, a lot of these tools can integrate with your travel programme. Um, so you can integrate them with your online booking tool or you can integrate them with your TMC. Um, you can have them as standalone as well. So there's lots of different ways that you can integrate that into your program and, um, and, and use it to, to augment what you've already got, or maybe lose a program to augment the, the tool itself. And, and I think as well, you have to think really hard about what you want to do with that. I certainly found that as we've gone through our RFP, a number of our stakeholders, like IT, for example, and maybe HR a little bit, have, have come more into the process um, because they've understood as we've gone through it, um, what it touches and how important it is. Um, I mean, there's a lot of complexity in there. And um, I think what we found is that we wanted to get deeper and deeper into some of the questions. And, and so we're now at the stage where we're doing deep dives with our final two suppliers, looking at what um, we really, really want from it. Um, the two key areas we looked at through the entire RFP, but just the initial stage and right down to the steep dive stages is the operational capability. So how is that um, supplier and their tool going to support your social security tax and immigration needs? Um, and then also at the IT architecture side of things and how is it going to interact with the rest of your program? Um, how do you want to, to automate it? Um, from, for my client, the, 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 one of the biggest sort of objectives is to make sure that the, the end user experience is simple and streamlined and that, you know, should we change suppliers anywhere along the process, um, be that a TMC or one of our tax suppliers, that, that they don't have to then move to a new tool and use something that is completely different. So we want it, the, the look and feel of it to remain the same, keeping that user experience simple, streamlined and effective. Um, and we want something that's future proof because um, obviously the pandemic happened and who really foresaw that and what it was going to do to business travel. So whatever tool we put in place, we want it to be able to incorporate anything around sort of entry requirements um, and maybe the public health side of things that, that might come along um, and make sure that you're also able to get access to those forms and any documentation that you need to be able to get into a country, not just the purely Brexit related areas. Um, and we've seen a lot of different things from the suppliers that, that, that we've, we've, we've looked at. Um, notes there. I think that we are um, really down in our last two sort of looking at the, the whether we want something that is very, very vendor agnostic or whether we want something that bolts very easily into our travel program. Um, and there's some of those things, you, you don't seem to have everything at the, at the same time. And um, I think one of the biggest things that, that I'm taking away from it is that we, we want something done very fast. So I said, we talked about it a lot. And then when it actually came to it, a lot of my stakeholders didn't, really recognize the importance of it. And now that they've recognized the importance of it, they want something now. Um, and 
it doesn't take into account the complexity of actually putting something in place. So we're getting feedback from suppliers to say that implementation can take 12 weeks and up to six months, depending on how bespoke you want something to be. Um, or some of them say they can do it much faster, but you might then only get something that only does part of what you, you need. And I've found that my actual RFP itself, you know, initially has asked, oh, can you do it in six weeks? And now I'm at the stage where we are eight weeks in and we're still not finished. So um, I think it's important to get your timelines right and actually be realistic about what you want to achieve and when you want to achieve it by anybody who's sitting here now saying we want to have a tool in place in January and haven't even started. That's not going to happen. Um, and that, that that comes from experience. So um, Thank you. As, as well with that, that because I know you and I've talked about this, that, um, you know, it, kind of everyone's latching onto this. So the suppliers that are out there are now kind of everyone's getting back back to travel. Everyone's getting ready. And this is a big part of that. And therefore, you're not the only customer asking. So there's a backlog. That'd be fair to say. Definitely. Um, I'm definitely sort of getting some feedback in there that, um, yeah, um, some of these suppliers are talking to multiple people and some of them are saying we can do this really quickly and it's being repeated over and over and over again. What we also found is that when you're asking for evidence of work that they've already been doing with other clients, many of them, a lot of them give you references you can't get a lot of references so you can't go and sort of look easily at, at who's doing this with many different people you have to pick on specific clients that they have and speak with them about how it's working for them certainly because a lot of organizations haven't got this in place already but that then has a knock-on effect on the involvement of suppliers into the rfps because as more and more of us put out these um, tenders then they're actually being stretched further and it's taking longer to to do that um as you suggested yeah okay um just to sort of summarize that and to and to wrap up because it is a, a it's a com complex subject um what if you were going to give the audience advice the audience we've got here we've got some um people on the buy-in side and we've got some people on the supply in the supply chain what's the sort of top bit of advice that you would give to the people on the buy-in side to start with What's like your number one top tip having gone through this and it being much more complicated than you thought it was going to be and much more lengthy than you thought it was going to be? My top tip would be to be um, to work closely with your stakeholders. So one of the greatest benefits that I've found is that from an early stage, I was working really closely with mobility and tax in particular um, in areas that maybe I didn't understand so well at that particular point in time. I've learned a lot. Um, and if you really try to understand what they need and then how that affects your travel program, because at the end of the day, the travel program is probably the biggest stakeholder in this because it's been affected from all different sides. Um, and it's your users, your, 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 your travelers um, who are going to be the people that are affected. If you get it wrong, they're going to be the ones that get turned away at the border or don't have the right documentation. Um, it's going to create a lot of noise. You know, it's exactly what you don't want from your travel program. So if you connect in with the right stakeholders and start maybe with a bigger group than you actually need, but whittle them down. So really work on identifying exactly who those key people are. Because what I found with, with my project is that I, I've got a team of stakeholders in this who aren't my normal travel stakeholders. So I've got people from the client's operational team involved and, and actually going forward I'd probably want to involve them more into the travel program because I think they have really valid and valuable things to say um but but yeah def definitely get out there and and speak with as many different functions you can and understand how this impacts on on them um I guess it. I guess that's the um uh, I suppose one of the symptoms of this being something new and and sort of pioneering leading the way is you don't really know Who's, who needs to be involved until you get deep into those conversations. So, okay, I think Catherine posted on the chat, if anyone has got any questions for Katie, um, you can pop them in the Q&A box at the bottom. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I'm gonna um, 
skip across to Helen to talk a little bit about sustainability and then we can come back at the end and we can do Q&A for both speakers if that's all right. Um, thanks Katie for that. Um, so Helen and I've known each other for a long time. We worked together. Helen was one of our voluntary board members at ITM, I think the first time we met, if not before then. Right. Um, and so when I came to Trip Actions and sustainability is very close to the heart of the folks at Trip Actions and we've got some good products that we've developed. So as marketing manager, it was quite important for me to kind of get under the skin of what was happening with sustainability. But also, I think like many people, two things occurred to me. One, I sat in my back garden where I couldn't hear, couldn't see a plane going overhead, couldn't hear any traffic, but the sun was shining and I could hear the birds singing for the first time in a very long time. And I couldn't help but think that maybe Mother Nature had a little hand in this. Um, and then the second thing, obviously, was that uh, on the return to travel, it became obvious to me that it was going to be easier, perhaps, to do something now than it was before. Um, and so I, I was on a, on a I got, I'm going to be honest here, I was on a sustainability webinar, we were still in lockdown, and I was like this, trying to focus, you know, and dozing off because it was so complicated and so scientific. And then Helen popped up on my screen and just made it really simple. I listened to Helen for about 15 minutes and was like, oh, I get it now. I understand what we need to do. So I phoned her afterwards and I think we spent only probably about half an hour and she gave me a bit more depth. Um, and it was so helpful to me that for today, I said, look, I really want to share, I want Helen to come and share the story that she shared that got me involved, that got me interested and actually that just made sense of everything and got to the number of the programme. So Helen, over to you. Thank you very much, Simone. That's a really kind introduction. It means a lot. So hopefully I'll be able to uh, recreate that again. So let's go. Um, so Catherine, could you just um, pop forward the first slide? So I'm here today um, uh, representing Cactus. I'm here to say um, represent, representing Cactus. I um, I work with Festive Road, um, but um, I also am a co-founder of Cactus, and Cactus stands for um, Climate Action for Corporate Travel Urgent Sustainability. Um, and it's a climate action group that we set up in 2019, and really it was to tackle the difficult and spiky conversation around the sometimes uncomfortable uh, uncomfortable conversation around the decarbonisation of the travel sector. Uh, it's a completely voluntary group, uh, it's no commercial drivers and anybody uh, that would like to get involved by all supplier side is very welcome to be part of it. And one of the key actions of Cactus is very much um, to help its members around education and awareness and using science based dialogue. Um, and our intention is to create a network of people that can lean on each other and help to, we want to understand that macro view of what we're um, dealing with and then understand where corporate travel fits into that overall picture. Um, and one of the key um, intentions of Cactus is actually confronting the reality of, of what we're dealing with in order to take action. Um, and last year I attended a webinar on combating climate change, um, which was supported by two youth ambassadors from the from WWF, the Worldwide Fund for Nature. And one of those was a young teenager um, in year 10, so she would have been 14, 15 years old, called Hattie Phillips. And the title of her, her presentation was Are You Sitting Uncomfortably? And I thought that that was like really appropriate for the topic that they were about to address because, you know, we do have to confront and face the, the uncomfortable reality of what we're dealing with, you know, where we've come from, where we've got to and where we need to get to so that we are better armed in order to take um, the right steps. So what we try to do is look at that macro view, some of that science, and then kind of back it into the corporate travel program. Uh, next slide, please, Catherine. Um, so humans have had a pretty uh, big impact on the planet in the short time that we've been here and a, a really useful visual that I came across and I use, which I'll try and um, verbalise for you, um, is to think of, um, when we think of the planet being 4.6 billion years old, if we make that a little bit more comprehensible and scale that, scale that back to 46 years old, then humans have been here for about four hours and our industrial revolution started about a minute ago. So we've had um, a, a short amount of time to make this quite a big impact um, that we've had on the planet. And this timeline here um, that we're looking at um, is 
from um, going back to 1960 when we first started measuring CO2 and some key milestones that we've seen um, along the way. This is obviously by no means, you know, all of the different activity that's taken place because there's a huge amount um, that's been going on, but just some, some key uh, milestones that I, I like to pull out. So back in 1960, Charles Keeling, who was an American scientist, he first um, evidenced that CO2 produced by uh, transport and industry and factories was negatively impacting the Earth's climate and contributing to the greenhouse gas effect. And the Keeling curve, as it's uh, now known, measures the progressive buildup of uh, carbon dioxide within, the, within our atmosphere. And I'm just going to share a, a visual a little bit later on that one. So that's back in 1960. We, we, we're measuring um, CO2 in the atmosphere. And in 1990, the first IPCC report, so that's the Intergovernmental Panel for um, Climate Change uh, report, came out and warned of global warming. And that's over 30 years ago now. Um, then in 2015 um, was the Paris Agreement, so that's an international treaty that was adopted um, and signed by 195 countries who all committed to limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And then in 2018 was the special report from the IPCC where um, multiple scientists um, warned of um, the need to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees within the next 12 years. So that's taking us to this first 2030 milestone. Um, and if we you know, didn't do that, then you know, if we don't do that, we're at risk of extreme drought, floods, heat and poverty for millions of people. Since then, there's also been the IPCC sixth assessment report, which was issued in August of this year. And the UN Secretary General said that the findings were a code red for humanity and that emissions have to peak by the middle of the decade if we are to be able to achieve our net zero target by 2050. So when we look forward, um, the, you, some of the, the key milestones are we need to halve our carbon emissions by 2030 and halve them again by 2040 in order to reach this net zero position, um, you know, which, which everybody's talking about in 2050. And that net zero is a balance between the amount of greenhouse gases put into the atmosphere and the amount removed. Next slide, please, Catherine. So this is the um, Keeling curve that I mentioned. So we started um, measuring the atmospheric CO2 in the 1960s, and there have been multitudes, uh, a multitude of events, reports, scientific warnings, um, data to say, you know, that we need to change this trajectory, but it is on this continual upward climb. And parts per million, you know, just keep going on the up um, and having an impact on um, global warming. So um, I think yesterday we were at 413 parts per million. And then um, last year, WWF, uh, the Living Planet Report, uh, was released and stated that 60% of mammals um, on the planet are livestock intended for human consumption, 36% are humans, and only 4% um, are wildlife. And that since 1970, we've witnessed a 68% decline in wildlife populations. Um, they've just plummeted. And if you, and to put that into economic terms that's comparable to the collapse of the top 10 global economies but the reason I sort of share that wider perspective is because you know everything that we do has this bigger impact um, on the environment and the very natural resources that support and sustain us so um, you know that's that's kind of the backdrop and it's not intended to be negative I personally need to know what's happening and what I'm dealing with in order to to take the right action and I want to be armed with the fact the facts. So hopefully that sort of gives you a bit of a backdrop around the science, where we've come from, where we need to go to, the timelines, and actually, you know, some of that impact that we're having um, uh, along the way. So we've got a lot of work uh, that we need to do in order to uh, reverse that. Uh, next slide, please, Catherine. So um, bringing it closer to home from a, a corporate travel perspective, where does corporate travel fit into all of this? So carbon emissions are accounted for by being classified into three different categories or scopes. So you've got scope one, which is direct emissions from owned or controlled resources. Scope two, indirect emissions from the purchase of electricity, steam, heating and cooling. And scope three, which is a, a massive category of many um, different items that fall in there. Um, and they are indirect emissions from a company's value chain. And this is where corporate travel sits. So it sits within um, scope three um, emission reporting. It's a voluntary category, um, but because it often accounts for a significant part of a company's um, overall carbon emissions and certain um, categories, you know, they, they really, it can be the majority of um, a, a business's carbon emissions. 
So because it accounts for a, a big percentage and also it is deemed to be one of the easier categories to measure and report upon. And I know that might um, raise a few questions straight away because uh, we know there are a lot of challenges around um, data and reporting. But because of those reasons, it is often um, reported, um, measured, reported and then included in the company's carbon footprint. So it's essential to measure emissions in order to uh, meet carbon reduction targets your company might set, but also it's as importantly to make sure those targets are aligned to the science. If we could just move forward, Catherine, please. So there's an initiative called Science Based Targets Initiative, which is a partnership between CDP, which is the formerly the Carbon Disclosure Project, the UN Global Compact, the World Resource Initiative and uh, sorry, World Resource Institute and WWF. And a carbon target is defined as science-based when it is in line with the level of decarbonisation that is required to meet the Paris Agreement. So it's backed into that science. And whilst many businesses um, may choose to make carbon reductions, they really do need to be aligned to the science in order to be meaningful. So, you, you know, we welcome, you'd welcome any effort to reduce carbon um, emissions. Um, so we, we, you know, we really encourage that, but aligning to a science-based target is really quite essential. So when you start to familiarise yourself with all of the component parts, the jigsaw puzzle, it provides more context into what we're trying to achieve and, and where corporate travel can fit in. So you've got this top down perspective of the science, the Paris Agreement, setting a science based target, aligning your company's carbon emission reductions into that target and then defining how your travel programme can influence that and, and play a part. Um, next slide, please, Catherine. So a really useful framework to use in order to support um, uh, that programme is the carbon management hierarchy. So this is um, avoid, reduce, replace, remove. Um, brilliant to refer to um, in everything that you do, really. And the actions at the top of the hierarchy um, are more impactful and are going to have more transformative um, change and last, um, lasting effect in terms of reducing a company's um, emissions. So where possible um, for carbon emissions, um, uh, avoid, avoid that activity. So avoid carbon intensive activities. Now, um, you know, we know from COVID that we've been successfully able to do lots of business by not traveling. And we also recognize there's huge value in traveling, but we need to make sure that we maintain um, non-essential travel, travel that you know, doesn't need to go back into that program. So avoid doing any activity in the first place is going to is going to uh, generate the biggest return for your program. Reducing that's doing whatever you do more efficiently. Um, replacing this is replacing high carbon energy sources with low carbon energy sources. So this is, um, for example, the uh, moving from uh, jet fuel to sustainable aviation fuel. And many of you will have seen uh, the announcement from Nestle and Trip Actions recently. And um, we're also moving from uh, combustion engine to electric fleet. So this is changing, um, replacing your energy source effectively. And then remove, that's the offsets. And those are emissions that cannot be eliminated by any of those other three activities. And that really should be done as a last resort. And offsets um, include many different initiatives. Um, tree planting is often quoted. It's, um, there, there are many, many effective um, projects which can be carbon avoidance projects. They can be negative in emission technology um, to remove carbon from the atmosphere. Um, but it really must be seen as a last resort. I think probably in quite recent years, offsets been at the top of the agenda and um, sort of like grabbing the headlines, whereas now it's very much recognised that we need to do a, a number of other things before we fall um, back to offsets um, as that last resort. Um, so just moving on to um, my penultimate slide, please. Um, so I just wanted to share with you um, a few ideas, hopefully to, to, to take away some tangible actions um, to help you start on your sustainability journey. I'm sure that many of you on, on this call will be um, quite advanced. Um, but just a, a few little pointers um, that we think have been useful for, for people that we've engaged with and we've, we've learned from people that we've been speaking to. So um, the first one will be to connect with your ESG, that's your environment, social and governance team within the business to understand what they're doing and how you can get involved. 
Um, secondly, measure your uh, CO2 emissions from business travel. If you do so already, do you report one scope for emissions? If not, can you start measuring and reporting those? Um, this third one, find out if you disclose to CDP, which was carbon disclosure project that came up a little bit earlier, earlier very briefly. This is a really interesting one because um, lots of customers or investors are looking for um, disclosure scores in order to understand exactly what companies are doing to minimize their environmental impact. Um, so if you can disclose uh, as a business um, to CDP, which will probably be managed at a you know, much higher level rather than you know, from a travel program perspective, but if you are as a business um, disclosing to, to, to CDP, um, then that is going to be beneficial um, from a, um, a partnership, a stakeholder investor perspective. And then if, when you're looking to work with your suppliers as well from a travel buyer perspective, if you include, um, do you respond to CDP in your RFIs and RFPs? And you can have a simple yes, no to begin with. You might just, you, you may not ask for their score. You might just want to understand if they disclose. Um, obviously if they do, they should be able to tell you the score. But actually just by including that in your RFI and RFP process, you're going to get your suppliers thinking as well about, you know, in order to do business with that, um, customer that you know I need to make sure that I am truly um, you know monitoring and taking action on my environmental impact and this is specifically around the climate change questionnaire which, which um, looks at climate change water security and deforestation so that's something that's really um, quite simple to do and can really accelerate engagement and uptake of um, commitments to um, in, environmental changes and then um, finally find out if your company has set a science-based science -based target and if not can you initiate this and then um, a couple of other things I just wanted to add, and you know, particularly as Simone mentioned at the beginning, you know, we we really do have an opportunity as we return to business travel now to um, think very carefully about what we put back into our programs. So we're starting from this zero or almost zero base, you know, in some instances. And it's a really good opportunity to review your program and take a, um, a purposeful approach to understand the true value that travel actually delivers to your business. Um, through uh, different lenses, so um, people, planet, and, and profit lenses, um, and that you know your your travel policy and what that looks like um, is really going to have a, a huge impact on um, the changes that you can make from a carbon um, emissions perspective. And then um, the last thing I just wanted to leave you with um, is just the word of caution, really, um, which is just. Um, we all just need to keep um, headlines in check, uh, I feel, at the moment. Um, and th this is certainly how I feel very personally. You know, we need to be careful around the headlines. We've got a lot of messaging coming out, uh, not just within in travel, but, you know, just everywhere we look, where people, um, businesses, uh, sorry, uh, you know, um, making um, claims for carbon neutrality. Um, and we need to make sure that there are actions behind some of those statements. And I just want to leave you with the definition of carbon neutrality and, and net zero. And there's a really good article on a website called Ecology, if, if you wanted to look at that, um, which really sort of um, clarifies in, in simple terms. But carbon neutral means purchasing carbon reduction credits equivalent to emissions released without the need for emissions reductions to have taken place. And I think that's really interesting because you could say, you, because the key thing about emissions reductions is that behavioural change. So it's understanding what's happening understanding the impact you're having, knowing what we need to achieve and actually making sure we're not putting some of those carbon emissions into the atmosphere. Actually, you could you could get to carbon neutrality without actually making that change, but you're, you're um, purchasing carbon reduction credits or offsets. And it's net zero, that means reducing emissions in line with the latest climate science and balancing remaining residual, residual emissions through carbon removal credits. So when we talk about you know getting to net zero in in 2050, it's 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 reducing those emissions and then just offsetting those residual emissions. So Catherine, just my last um, screen is uh, just a quote really. Um, it's it's don't sit this one this one out. Do something. You are by accident or fate alive at an absolutely critical moment in the history of our planet. And I know that um, some people um, can find it really overwhelming um, when we start talking about the environment, the complexity of what we need to deal with. In fact, so overwhelming, you kind of, you, you, you kind of like, I don't know what to do, so I'll do nothing. Um, I would, and I hope that this has been positive, this presentation, and I haven't scared you too much with my sort of uh, scene setting at the beginning. 
Um, but we really have got an opportunity to do something and uh, the, the biggest um, threat to climate change is um, inaction. So um, do something. Thank you, Helen. Honestly, I've got loads of questions. Um, <laughs> And um, I love this quote at the very end. That's I'm going to steal that as well as everything else that I st I've stolen from you. Yeah, it's Carl's. You can have it. <laughs> I think, do you know, for me, that what you just said is the absolute point. It is overwhelming. And if I'm really honest, I was one of those people who, because I didn't feel like anything I did was going to make a difference, I kind of ignored it. It was too big for me to pay any attention to. And it genuinely was listening to you and you actually get into the nub of the issue that lives in our immediate world, i.e. removing carbon from flights or, or you know, um, the, the, uh, from, from, from fleet as well. So that then became sort of, OK, I can I can maybe that's that's a small enough chunk that I can get my head around and hopefully do something with. And um, many of you hopefully saw our press release um, last week when we announced our partnership with Nesto, which Helen mentioned that came it was an opportunity that came across my desk um, from an old colleague who said, you know, you could go directly to Nesto and you could basically arrange for customers to to buy sustainable aviation fuel regardless of what size those customers are unless they could aggregate that fuel for you and have it delivered transparently and give you the right report back so that you can claim that or they can claim that sorry in their scope three carbon reduction targets and I'm like okay that's a real thing for me putting sustainable aviation fuel on an aircraft you know and it can be mixed with jet fuel so let's say you put 50 percent on one flight and 50 percent jet fuel You've, you've actually reduced, you know, your carbon by 50% in, in a flight today. You can do that today. And it all became really real for me with, with the SAF initiative. And, and so that's what we've done. Um, you know, we've partnered with Nesta for now. Um, but the, the purpose of us is to be the ag aggregator. And, and frankly, you don't even need to be a Trip Actions customer to do this. If anyone's interested, just get in touch with me or with Helen and she'll point you in the right direction. Because if we can start to buy SAF, if we can help the airlines to buy sustainable aviation fuel, it will become, it, you know, we produce more efficiently, the more that we produce, hopefully the cost will come down, it will become, you know, it's only one answer, it's not the answer, there's not enough sustainable aviation fuel on the, that can be, that can be produced to replace all of the jet fuel, but it is something we can do today, so um, yeah. It's really valid and, and that comes up a lot, you know, uh, naturally um, SAF um, is getting a lot of coverage um, and it's, it's, it's an amazing initiative and a lot of people will say, well, you know, SAF's not the answer and it's, it's, it is part of that overall solution. I think that's really important that we all need to, to focus on a number of different levers that we can, we can pull, a number of different changes that we can make. You know, we have got some massive changes to make, um, but, uh, you know, all activity, all positive activity is going to contribute to, to where we need to get to and make a difference. Yeah. Now you, um, Catherine, can you just flick to the slide before, if you don't mind, because that will remind me what I was going to ask you. Um, yeah. So uh, one of the questions you said, find out if your company has set a science based target and if not can you initiate this so i've been asking our customers and our potential customers that i speak to you know if they've initiated if they've initiated a target and if it's a science-based yeah. target and actually what they're baselining against and that and it kind of goes back to the piece i said at the beginning around most of them are, are saying 2019 so in 2019 their carbon expenditure was huge right and yeah. then pandemic came along and actually it was nothing as it relates to flights for most companies so they've done it overnight right they've they've more than halved their carbon emissions but the reality is that travel's coming back and it is coming back and so I think for travel managers and sustainability managers who are looking at travel the 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 piece that's important is how do you control the the return of that um that travel and the carbon that's emitted from it which is a slightly different perspective but it's one I think to leave you all thinking about is this is not about stopping something this is about now controlling the increase of it and there are different ways that you can do that and Helen I don't know if you want to finish on any advice around that well just that it's, it's really valid and it's an amazing opportunity to um, do an assessment of the different types, types of travel that you have um, you know understand uh, what's adding value to your business um, and you know, don't don't be 
um, a threat. It's really difficult in our industry because we want, you know, the, the best for our industry, but we also need to balance it against the needs of the planet. So I think we've all learned to, to work in very different different ways, can be really effective. So just let's get that balance right. You know, in-person in meetings um, are great. They um, create different opportunities. But let's be really clear about what, you know, exactly as you said, Simone, what can and should go back into that travel programme and not miss this, quite frankly, once in a lifetime opportunity yeah. to make a difference. So, so Jen, Jen's has um, popped a question in our chat, actually. Um, he said, during the pandemic, we hardly had any reductions at all. And following the pandemic, I think most companies have realised that they may carry out some of their business virtually. In my company, as much as 50%. What kind of impact do you think this will mean? Do you mean, Jens, what kind of impact will it have on carbon reduction or on... Yeah, the, yeah, that's what I meant, right? I'm sorry, I wrote reductions. I meant emissions, yeah. of course. Sorry. Yeah. Helen, is there any stats around... I mean, I, I heard something the other day that, you know, we've all stopped flying, but actually the carbon emission hasn't really changed over the last 12 to 18 months yeah so i think i think i've seen some stats around like you know there was like a seven percent dip but you know actually when you when you extrapolate that over longer term that's that's not going to have a um a, a big enough impact in order to get us to net zero by 2050 and i think that's probably that really clearly illustrates how much change we need to deliver so when you look at the cessation of travel and then so many other activities that didn't take place i know some some did increase uh, but you know when you when you think about uh, the reduction in emissions um you know through um 2020 and into 2021 and that still has had a very very minimal impact i think that kind of illustrates the size of the challenge that we've got um so uh, for, for me it just kind of focuses the mind even more on okay we need to look at every element of everything that we do naturally you know we're, we're looking at it from a, um, a business travel perspective um but you know it, we need to, to examine every area of our business um in order to be able to to make a difference yeah yeah oh, it's a huge task ahead um i have one final question it's around cdp um so yeah. it's a bit more of a practical question but is cdp the only um organization that you you would ask about is, is it is it is there anybody else that they could be reporting to or is it only cdp yeah i think that there are a number of different um disclosure companies cdp is um you know very much kind of viewed as kind of like that that gold standard but there are a, a number of others i can send those across um which you can circulate to um, attendees if you like. Um, but yeah, it's the it's the principle really of making sure you are measuring um, your impact and disclosing that. So it's, it's, it's all around transparency in everything that you do so that people um, know what uh, companies that they're working with are, are doing. And then they can make the decision on whether that's the, the, the right company to work with. Um, because that will also impact, you know, their scope three emissions as well. So, you know, that scope three emissions with, um, you know, all of the supply chain partners in there is, is pretty massive. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're probably out of time now, aren't we, Catherine? Is that why you've appeared on our screen? I've popped up. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're um, yeah, we're closing in on the R. So, um Helen, um, Katie and Simone, thank you all so much for um, for sharing your insights on two really, really important topics. And Jens, um, thank you again for coming and joining us to, um, to give us that global update. Um, and thank you to Trip Actions for um, for supporting us um, today um, for this for this town hall. I hope you uh, hope everybody found it helpful and useful. It's great to reconnect. And um, we will certainly, Helen, I'll certainly be taking you up on that offer of some more information for our, for our participants. And you will all receive a recording of this town hall. So thank you very much. And um, hopefully see you all in Berlin. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you.